Hi everyone, we still have a few minutes to our session and we wanted to take this time to get to know you better. So for today's session, we have speakers joining from three different countries. So Tuba from Pakistan, Lea from Vietnam, Jane and Wiki from Thailand. So could you share with us what's your go-to meal or snack while working from home? Maybe I can oh. start first. So for myself, I have been eating a lot more instant noodles. Recently, <laughs> I discovered these sour and spicy noodles, and I love it so much that I ate it three times last week. Yeah, so what about all of you? All right, so let me share mine. Uh, so I have a sweet tooth, and I love eating chocolates, cakes, cookies. And so basically, my go-to snack uh, while working from home is anything sweet. Oh, I love so eating chocolate. Tuba is a sweet yeah. tooth programmer. We need to go <laughs> to get the coats running. Yeah, same with me. Sometimes I finish like two pack of chocolate in one day. I feel bad after that, but it tastes so good, <laughs> especially when I'm stressed out, you know, dark chocolate. Oh. Really cool. Well, what I'm about the gems? Yeah. I'm a caffeine addict, so uh, anything that goes with coffee, sometimes a big plate of uh, pancakes, sometimes some chocolate, sometimes something with salt. That's good for me. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> what oh, about my you, turn, right? So yeah. my turn, right? I, I do normally uh, eat <laughs> wow. because, because uh, I have one, uh, one free one. So I, yeah, I love ice cream. Much. <laughs> we have a lot of sweet tooth developers here today. Wow. Uh, I'm I'm definitely on Wiki side. I'm a caffeine person as well. So it just throw me the dark the black coffee and then I will start my day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But aside from that, like um, how's everyone doing? Like how's working from home so far? Or are you are you folks back to the office yet? No, we are. Still yet working from home in Pakistan. Yeah, I'm actually stuck, still stuck from overseas. I'm in oh. Sydney at the moment. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, Our wow. apologies. So, Leah, do <laughs> darling in from Sydney. Oops. No, but I'm from Vietnam, but I got stuck here. So, yeah. <laughs> what about well, things in Thailand? We, we are all right. Uh, everything opened up, but uh, we take the approach of having. The office as a collaborating space more than working space because uh, we don't know if things are going to get worse or not yeah mm. okay so, yeah so the curfew is stopped solid right but we still be careful work at, working at home and eat everything at home <laughs> <laughs> so you must be a chef no yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 prepared, I prepared the chicken for my dinner already for <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I'm, going, I'm going to fry the chicken and some uh, mushroom. Yeah. I gotta uh, name this to instead of la kopi, it's gonna be la dinner. It's for the next <laughs> round. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, I think what, what, what we learned during the pandemic is to cook better. That's one of yeah, the things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so thanks for sharing, everyone. I think. Uh, yeah, we'll be starting our session soon. And meanwhile, we will be moving the speakers backstage and we'll see you in a short while. Hi, everyone. A big hello to all of you. I'm Joey. And I'm Jia Sing, and we are both from the Google Developer Relations team. So thank you so much for joining us for La Copy today. We hope everyone is keeping safe wherever you are. Do give yourself a shout out on our live chat and let us know where are you tuning in from. So for me and Jia Sing, we're both like tuning, uh, dialing in from Singapore and we have speakers from Pakistan, Thailand and Sydney. Yep. So in case we have friends joining us today, who haven't had the opportunity to join us for the past 11 Lakopis at Developer Space, let us share a little about who we are and what we do. So Google Developer Space is a home for developers and startups from around the region to connect, engage, and be inspired. We want to empower and connect the community 
to our people, programs, network, and technologies. So La Coffee at the Open Space is our monthly open mic night where we select a tech team and speakers submit their topics to share about their best practices, ideas, and projects built on Google Developer Tools and also other development tools. And this month, our topic is web development. Today, we have a total of four speakers joining us. We have Tuba. She's a software engineer at Folio Tree, dialing in from Pakistan. We have Leah. She's the program lead and at Women Meet Tech and also a Women Tech Maker Ambassador from uh, Vietnam, but dialing in from Sydney. And lastly, we have Jane and Wiki, our dual speaker, dialing in from Thailand. They will each be sharing for about 10 minutes and you're welcome to submit your question on our YouTube and Facebook live chat. And we will get to the question at the end of every speaker session. Also, not forgetting that we'll be giving away some cool virtual gifts to those tuning in today. So don't forget to stay tuned until the end to find out how. Without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Tuba who will be sharing with us about streamlining your web app development with Firebase extension. Tuba is a software engineer at Folio Tree, and she helps her team maintain and scale application for enterprise organization. She's also a program manager at Circle at Cairo, where she trains women in Pakistan, aiming to bridge the digital gender divide. So over to you, Tuba. Thank you, Joe and Gia. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. So my name is Tuba, and today I'm going to talk about how to streamline web app development with Firebase extension. So first, I would love to know how many of you here with us have worked with either Firebase or Firebase extension. So let me know in the comments that how many Firebase friends do I have here. And also, if you have any questions regarding my talk, please feel free to leave them in the comments, and we will answer them towards the end. Uh, all right, so let's start with my quick introduction. So I'm a software engineer at Poly3, and um, apart from the professional work I do, I'm I also like to contribute to the community. I'm uh, I like to contribute to the community. I'm I'm part of different organization in my home country. Uh, you can see the logos here. I'm part of NG Girls, Tech Hero, and Circle. So coming back to the topic on the screen, you can see a developer like us. And you guys can relate that when we develop any application, be it of any domain, we face certain challenges, problems, or kind of stuck with repetitive tasks, like sending emails when something happens uh, in your application, or managing large images and optimizing them, or making sure that when the user deletes his or own account, um, any info tag with that user automatically gets deleted, and stuff like translating, etc. So these are some of the mundane tasks that we have to implement in almost every other application. And often at time, tasks like these take most of our time. And being a developer, we know that even if we develop a teeny tiny functionality, it requires testing, debugging, and maintenance. And it eventually affects our productivity. So due to these tasks, we might not be able to focus 100% on the features that actually make our app unique and awesome. So to solve these problems um, for us, Firebase has introduced Firebase extensions. So what are these extensions? So this extension is a no-code solution to common developer problems like um, sending email or um, shortening of your URL and a lot more. And since these extensions are pre package solution, all you need to do is you need to install it, configure it, and they are ready to use. So the great news with these extensions are that these extensions are open source, which means that the developers can easily uh, visit their code repos, read their code, and understand what is actually happening under the hood. And extension, um, these extensions also use the existing Firebase architecture. So if you install any extension, what actually happens is that it ties together the existing Firebase products like cloud storage or cloud functions, and even third-party tools like Bitly and uh, Mailchimp, uh, depending on the extension you selected. So, uh, so when you install an extension, you basically leverage the powerful existing architecture of Firebase without really implementing anything. And the best news is that these extensions are tested and maintained by the smart people at Google. So we do not need to worry about their maintenance. 
So the once the vice man said that the best code is actually no code at all, and now with the help of this extension, we can actually write the better better codes for our application. And let's see how uh, we can uh, we can use this extension in our applications uh, to make our app much more better. So I have a quick demo app ready. All right, so this is my demo app. It's called Readers Den. And if you are an avid reader, you might relate that how much we love to write reviews of our favorite books or write down the quotes from our favorite book. So this app basically serves that purpose. So I love reading books. And these are some of my books that I've read recently during the lockdown. So this app, through this app, you can easily add a book, uh, adding some some information of the books like uh, reviews or quotes and add the picture. Then it has list page where all the uh, all your books are displayed and, and a details page where you can even uh, see the details of the book. So the problem with this app is that in it is its list page. It shows the picture of all the books, but these pictures are not very optimized. So when I take a picture from my mobile app, uh, it, the size of the image is usually large. And when I upload these pictures on this app, um, it takes time to load these pictures. And uh, right now, the data is very few. We have only three images. But as soon as the data increases, the delay would be more. And if the user is using this app on a mobile phone with slow internet, then the user experience is worse. So I need to solve this problem. And to do, do that, I need to make um, thumbnails of these each images. And for that, I can either use a third party tool and I, I use this third party tool, implement it, and test it and debug it. And the other way is to just use Firebase extension and do nothing. So I would prefer the latter one. And it's very simple to use the Firebase extension. So this is the Firebase um, website. You can see all nine extensions available here. They are very easy to use. Right now, I need to use the resize image extension. So I'll go to the details page. So each extension has a robust details page. You can find all the information that you need to know on this uh, page. And as I mentioned earlier, that these extensions are open source. So you can easily find the source code of this extension by clicking on this link. So I can either install the extension uh, using console or 5 CLI. Uh, for this demo, I'm using uh, the console. All right, so you have to first select your app uh, to install a, uh, to install uh, this extension. So this is my app. I'll I'll inst I'll click my app, and it will redirect uh, me to the installation page. So this is the installation page. It has all the relevant information. You can see uh, the instance ID of this uh, extension. You can e also see that when this instance extension is installed, what other resources are created. So for resize image extension, it's using cloud storage and cloud functions. You can also review the access that is granted to this extension. And this is uh, the, uh, the main important part. This is the part where you configure your extension. So you can, uh, it asks for certain information like the location of your, of your cloud function or your cloud storage uh, bucket. I'll just leave it to default. And this field, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart of this extension. Here you define uh, the dimension in which you want your image to be resized. So uh, I need a thumbnail image. And I think 200 by 200 is the perfect size for thumb thumbnail image. But if you want your image to be resized in other dimensions, you can just simply add more dimensions by adding a comma. You can add multiple dimensions as well. It will also ask if you want to delete the original image. For now, I, I need to keep the original image because I'll display I'll display the original image in the details page. Then you can uh, also define the storage path and the cache uh, control header. So I'm not going to install it right now since it takes a couple of minutes. I have an already installed extension available over here. It has all the similar configuration. And you can even reconfigure your extension after installing it. So it's very, very simple. And you can also check that which um, resources are created with this extension. And you can check the logs of this extension as well, uh, the cloud function as well. So this is how simple uh, to install and configure uh, the extension. Now my extension is configured. All I need to do is just use it. So I'll go back to my uh, app. And I just quickly add another book. So 
so i'll just add another book this is another of my favorite book blink i just completed last week if you like reading the books this book is amazing you should uh, read this book all right so um it's it's up, my i think my internet is not working very fine it's uploading the image and now i post this image so as soon as my image is posted it's here i have a typo over here the name is not correct so as soon as my image is uploaded i will go back to the storage this is the firebase storage and actually this is where my all the images are stored so i go to the ddes den folder and all right i just quickly refresh this this folder and now you can see that my image this a4 image is uploaded this is uploaded and if you see uh, carefully we have two more version of this file one with 100 by 100 dimension and another one is 200 by 200 dimension it is that easy to resize your image and you can even see the size of these images so you can see that um, these are actually resized images and uh, within just few clicks i i configured the extension i i resized my images and they are just ready to use so if you see that there is a slight um, a difference in the name of the images uh, so the original image is just a4 and the resized image has the dimension appended to it so what i need to do is i just need to make few tweaks in my code uh, since my code currently fetches the uh, fetches the images from the original um, image name so this is uh, basically the function which fetches the images from the cloud storage is it just take the original image name so what i need to do now is so what i need to do now is very simple this is basically the um, the original image name so what i need to do is i need to split the image using this dot operator i'll split, split the string and it will split the name into two parts first is the name of the image and second is the extension and all i need to do is just append extension uh, just append the dimension uh, to uh, the image name and and join the string together so this is all i need to do i have already um, updated my function so i'll just comment this old function and uncomment the I hope this function is visible, and we can even share this project link with you uh, after the talk. So I'll just um, so this is my updated function. It is just uh, uh, it is just adding the uh, dimension 200 by 200 in the in in my image name. It's just as simple as that. And let's save this function and refresh my application. All right. Meanwhile, uh, my server is starting again. So this is how easy it is. Within the few clicks of installing and configuring my extension, I'm able to use my extension and make my app better. And I have solved my problem, which I mentioned earlier. My images are loading much much faster than before. Uh, currently, there is some issue with my internet. That's why this is not loading right now. We can share this link with you after uh, the presentation and can add. I'll share this link uh, with you on the comments, and then you can easily see that how quickly my images are loading right now. Uh, so th that is how easy the extension is to use, and there are eight other extensions that are currently available that you can explore. They are very easy to use, and with using these extensions, you can uh, also make your app better and solve your problem. So that was all from my side. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And let's hear if we have any other questions.
Thanks, Tuba. I really enjoyed the demo. And I'm sure, I'm sure wish we have like more time to check out the rest of the extension. Um, now, maybe let's take a look at the questions from the audience. Uh, so for those tuning in, if you have any questions for Tuba, feel free to drop them on the live chat and we will get to it. While waiting for the questions to roll in, um, Tia Singh, I believe we managed to collect some questions during registration. Maybe we can uh, go ahead and flash that first for Tuba. Yep, sounds good. So one of the questions we have the, we have is, how can I resize all existing images in Firebase storage? All right, a great question. So uh, if you check the code of each extension, you can see that the extensions are actually triggered uh, when any image, when there is any changes in the storage, um, in Firebase storage. So if you want to resize the existing uh, images, what you can do is that you can either you can either um, re-upload that image in the storage, or you can uh, you can create your own Firebase cloud function, and you can use the existing function that is existing code that is available in the um, GitHub repositories, and you can use that, and you can trigger the extension by adding uh, adding a new dummy image, or you can uh, you can trigger the extension by by maybe click by, by maybe uh, by maybe with any other HTTP request. So you have to use the existing um, code that is available in this uh, GitHub repository, and you have to make your own uh, Firebase Cloud function for that. Ooh. Thanks so much, Tuba. I Thank think you. yeah. Just want to let you know, you know, you have quite a number of fan on the live chat. You know, let's go, yeah. Tuba. Great, Tuba. <laughs> And we have a lot of audience tuning in from different countries as well. There are people tuning in from Netherlands and India. And uh, in fact, I think there are some questions for you on the live chat. But, you know, uh, because we are running out, of, we need to make sure that we are on time so that the rest of the speakers have their uh, session as well. Um, Tuba, so for those who, have, who still have more questions, Tuba will be joining you on the live chat soon uh, after this. So just keep the questions coming and then she will get that answer on the live chat. Thanks so much, Tuba, for your time. Thank, thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Next up, we have Leah Troop. She's the program lead at Women Meet Tech and a Women Tech Makers ambassador in Vietnam. Leah will be sharing about how we can use Flutter for web development. She's a college professor in Boston, turned tech advocate in Vietnam and she has led multiple community events by TEDx, Google Developer Group Vietnam, and Women in STEM program in the US Consulate General Ho Chi Minh City around tech and women empowerment. Leah's mission is to make coding and tech more accessible for everyone, especially for women and minorities in Vietnam and around the region. Over to you, Leah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chia Tien and uh, Joey and uh, hope that everyone is uh, doing well tonight. Um, and it's a great opportunity for me to uh, share my experience using Flutter for the web. Um, okay, uh, today discussion, we will talk about why Flutter web and how it works. And then I will uh, include with the simple code demo of how to write your first Flutter app on the web. So a quick introduction about myself, my name is is uh, Leah Chuk, and I'm the program lead at the Women Me Tech, uh, the program sponsor and endorsed by the US Concept Ho Chi Minh City. I'm also the product strategist at On the Lock in Saigon High Tech Park and Women Tech Maker Ambassador for Vietnam. I do enjoy experiment a wide range of uh, technologies, and um, I want to make technical more, more accessible for everyone and to use that to empower more people. I actually even try to teach my cat how to code. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, so um, just a quick questions for you guys. Uh, which web development frameworks are you using? Uh, please feel free to comment in the chat box. And if you're any uh, Flutter user here, please also let us know. So whether it's React, Angular, Vue.js, Rails, or Diangle, or Flutter, just let us know. Okay, so why I explore, uh, explore Flutter web? I do believe that when you bring your application into the web browser, it will open up a lot of opportunities. And when it's come to Flutter, it's the practicality of using Flutter 
uh, in one code base across multiple platform, whether it's mobile, web development, desktop, or whatever it else. And um, when I first heard about uh, the uh, material designs, I just fell in love with it immediately. Um, this is based on the um, very important um, leverage of using the UI development approach that the Flutter team has been pursuing since the beginning. So when I learned that the material design is incorporating with Flutter, I was so thrilled to pick up Flutter immediately. And last but not least, I want to explore uh, Flutter so that I can be ready when there's more production quality arrive in the future. So here's some example of the uh, Flutter web application that's been built. You can easily find that on the Flutter web showcase. And um, one significant um, application that's been built um, using the Flutter web support is Answer. It's the no-code tool for building better storytelling web app pages. Um, you can explore this in, in your own time. And just a quick uh, demonstration uh, for you guys to see um, how an actual uh, web page is being built using Flutter Web. As you can see, that is is look um, you know similar um, in 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 any other way uh, that be, whether it's being built by other uh, framework. Um, however, this is uh, slow, a little bit low in the performance at the moment, but um, so far is still um, good for for a very uh, basic, simple um, web application. Okay, so when we uh, come down into you know the components of the traditional web web page, um, there's three important pillars of the website. As we all know, is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, each for different um, roles, such as structure, style, and function. In Flutter Web, um, it's all written in Dart. So with the web support, you can compile existing Flutter codes written in Dart into a client experience that can be embedded into the browser and deployed to any uh, web server. So um, here's an example of the styling and layout of Flutter um, in a simple hello world. So when I'm doing a little bit of the research, um, I found this uh, very uh, interesting um, uh, concept from uh, Kevin Moore. He's the product manager for Flutter and the Dart uh, web technology. So the core goals of an efficient web framework is this. It has to be secure, linkable, indexable, composable, affordable, and especially updatable. So these are the core goals um, of the guiding light of the Flutter team since the beginning to, to building this uh, Flutter web framework. Okay, so how it works. So the Flutter support um, the generation of the web content render using the standard based web technology. As I mentioned, is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The core drawing layers of Flutter is on top of the standard browser APIs. Um, it is completely in Dart and use Dart optimize a JavaScript compiler. And um, when we're using a combination of DOM, Canvas, and CSS, you can use all this feature of Flutter across um, all different uh, browser. So how does it look like in the real project? So say with Amster web app, we can see that when we dig down into the code, we can see that the uh, Flutter DOM canvas um, built in, in Flutter. So as you can see with the, the code uh, example here, or in example of uh, uh, rent me, um, you can see that there's um, men.dart, a JS is Dart and use Dart optimized JavaScript compiler as shown in this, uh, this slide. So when we uh, let's come into the next section where we do the code demo, and you can easily find this um, code lab on the um, a Flutter uh, code lab, building your first web application uh, using Flutter. So what we're going to build is we're going to build a simple uh, web web page with the sign of form, and this is how it looked like. Okay. So, but first, in order to start, we need to get the uh, start a web application. We need to enable the web development environment um, by uh, configuring the enable web. We need to um, do the Flutter upgrade. So right now, Flutter is still in, in uh, beta. Um, and then we need to um, config, as I mentioned, 
uh, enable web. It's gonna take some time, but yeah, okay. So next, we I think we should run Flutter Doctor to see if any issues. Cool. So it seems like there's no issue found. And then nextly, we move into uh, see what there's a Flutter device. Good. Now we see that there's a web server and the Chrome. Okay. So um, I understand that many um, beginners, many uh, new um, developers who want to explore Flutter, um, who doesn't want to go through all this hustle of install and config the ID, um, there's a good news for you guys because now that we have um, the that part, the that pet with Flutter support um, for for uh, Flutter project and Dart. Um, as it's shown over here, um, in the code lab, we actually have the, um, the sample code that you can just copy and paste into uh, Dartpad and click Run. And here, they will already have the um, starter web application. Okay. So in our IDE, we will we'll click on a simulator. And this time, it's not iOS or Android device, but it's the Chrome web. Is some time for it to restart the application. Okay, so this is how it should look like. Awesome. So next, we need to um, show the welcome screen by adding the class definitions for the, the welcome screen widget. And uh, we need to update the button. So when we press the button, it will lead to the welcome on the screen. Then um, we need to add the uh, show welcome screen method. And we add the route. So um, I mentioned this all of this uh, is included in the um, Flutter um, code lab. So if you want to, uh, in your own time, you can also visit and um, you know try it on your own. So when it's come to um, showing the welcome screen, this is how it should look like. So when you click on that uh, blue button, sign up, it will lead you to the welcome screen. Yeah. OK, so set number two, we need to enable the sign-in progress tracking. So remember, when we key in our information, we want the user to complete the entire form before they can submit. So um, we need to en enable this, this uh, tracking prospect, uh, progress tracking by um, adding the method to uh, update the form progress. And then we call the update form progress in the form when the form changes. And uh, we update the on press button, um, the, the property again. And add the animated progress indicator. And uh, this is the final product. So as you can see, when I key in my name, um, my username, um, and now it's allow me to um, click into the sign up button and it's lead to the welcome screen. So I think it's uh, pretty uh, uh, straightforward. Um, and I want to also mention there's the Dart Dev tool that is incorporated in, in your IDE. Uh, with this, um, they already have the support for Flutter web app. Um, however, their um, web app can be used cannot be used with the timeline memory and performance views. Um, instead, you can still use the uh, browser tools such as the Chrome Dev tools. Um, especially for the Flutter inspectors, it's only work with the Flutter apps um, for other web applications. You can also use the traditional, you know, like popular tools, the Chrome that tools is what the uh, web developers are using. So in conclusion, um, I do believe, again, you know, Flutter code run in the web browser, it will open up a lot of possibility. So, um, this will be an easy path for developers to take the existing more applications to the web. And now that we have uh, Dartpad and uh, CodePen also, that, that can let you quickly experiment that uh, with Dart Code and Flutter without having all the, the hustle of installing the ID, I think it will lower the, the entry uh, barriers for um, new uh, beginners or um, you know, other people to start exploring this uh, framework. So um, 
Flutter still in beta right now is far from production ready, but um, I think they're definitely heading to the right direction. Um, if you're looking for something to build on the web, um, maybe it's not ready yet, the best option right now. However, I do think that it would be well worth for you to, to consider to explore. Um, because when it comes to the massive benefits of having one code base um, in, in multiple platform. So uh, will Flutter for web eventually able to replace traditional web development? Um, maybe I'll leave it to you to decide. And um, maybe you can, on your own time, try to code lab yourself to explore whether it is for you or not. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude my section. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to share with us on the, uh, the comment box. Thank you. Thanks, Mia. That was a very interesting presentation. And it's really motivating me as well as a web developer myself to try out Flutter sometime. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So now let's take a look at some questions. Um, I think we actually have a few coming in from the live chat. So let's proceed to that. If we have more time, we will definitely uh, check out the questions that we received during registration as well. So this is one. This is Vinod from YouTube. Uh, Vinod is asking how much easier it would be to move Flutter for web development from a React.js background. OK. Um, I actually did try React.js before. And uh, for me, I do find that um, Flutter is, is easier for beginners um, because it's more visual, especially for, for someone like me when I look at certain applications. Um, uh, with the support of the material design and the widget uh, layout, it's helped me a lot with my um, designing and planning and coding process. So um, if I were to say that for, for, for JS to Flutter, I think uh, it's quite intuitive for, for, for me, especially if you, for you, especially if you're a visual learner like me. So I don't think it's a problem. So just maybe just you know, starting out trying some code, um, code labs like I, I just show you. Um, there are also a lot of um, tutorials online or you they need that you can explore. All right. So I think we also have another one. This is also coming in from YouTube. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, uh, Drew <laughs> Mita. Yeah. So um, what is the best ID to use Flutter for web development? Um, I think it's come down to two options, uh, VS Code, or um, I actually use Android Studio to do this. <laughs> but VS Code is a popular one um, uh, with, with, with everything um, incorporated in, in that. Um, it's pretty simple um, uh, uh, layouts of the ID as well. So it's pretty intuitive to use. I try both. Um, so it's just a matter of your preference. Yeah, so VS Code or Android Studio is still fine. All right. I think we have time for one last question. So this is by Vina asking from YouTube. Hi, Leah. How about the form validation on Flutter? Is that similar like JS validation? Uh, I think it's somewhat similar. Um, like like uh, the for me, Flutter is just for the um, for the uh, user interface only so whatever is come in the in the back end is similar with other um stack that you can use um so i don't think it's much different if i understand your questions correctly okay yeah. so um Bina, if you'd like to clarify your question feel free to continue on the live chat and then uh, leah will be heading there soon i think that's all the time we have for leah's session so um Thank you, everyone, for the question. Thank you, Leah. There's actually a question coming in from both our Facebook live stream and also <laughs> YouTube live stream. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it to you to see you, uh, which one you want to head to first to continue answering the question from the audience. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh -huh. Leah. Next up, we have two speakers, James and Wiki, joining us from Thailand to share about the use of Angular in enterprises. James is a full stack engineer at Flow Account and a web enthusiast running the Angular Thailand community. Woo, shout out to Angular Thailand. 
And Ricky is the CTO at Flow Account, who has bu been building software for more than 10 years now. So I believe the both of them have great insights to share with everyone tuning in. Without wasting any more time, let us welcome the two of them to the stage. Over to you, Jame and Ricky. Hi, Hi guys. Hi everyone. So today we are going to talk with you about why does enterprise use Angular? Before that, we let we introduce ourselves first. Hi, I'm Ricky. Uh, I'm the CTO of Flow Account. Flow Account is a cloud accounting software. Uh, we are running a SaaS business model. So if you guys ever heard of Zero and QuickBooks, we are similar to them, but uh, catered to Thai small, medium-sized businesses, uh, customized for the Thai workflow. Yep. Hello. So, yeah, so my turn. So my name is Siwat Ka Leung, or you just call me James. I am the full stack engineer at the Flow Account. And I'm also the one of the organizers of the Angular Thailand. Before we go further, let's define what S is an enterprise. When we think about enterprise, what does come first to your mind? Is it a giant company with the thousand of employees? Does it have a lot of revenue? Does it involve financial or health concern or of users? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything is correct. <laughs> so enterprise software stability affect mad user and customers so it's translate to not being able to transfer money in a crucial situation just like bank or stock markets or not being able to get appointment in crucial cases like getting an appointment with doctors these days we have to get it online because of the pandemic as you know it and uh, getting appointment at the government office or lining in queues on digital queuing system for the government offices. So this is why equation enterprise equal risk is really valid for today's world. Because people rely on uh, stability and internet has become like electricity where they cannot live without. So any organization have employee churn. The bigger the organization equal bigger churn. While companies have a lot of churn, business needs to continue. The show must go on. That's why we need a stable technology with a stable maintainability to continue these businesses. And yeah, of course, people can may, may leave and business has to go on. So this is why the most reliable technology is considered for enterprise. And an enterprise must choose the one that will not deprecate it or discontinue. So James, how do we choose a reliable front-end technology? So let's compare the top three front-end technology right now. We will go through these three most popular today, Angular, React, and Vue. So the Angular and React were started as an internal technology driven by Google and Facebook, respectively, to solve many of challenges encountered in developing single-pay applications. While Vue was started by one ex-Google developer, Ivan Yu, his main reason because of Angular, I guess, but because he was using AngularJS back then. And I quote this from, uh, from him. I figured what if I could just extract the part that I really liked about Angular and build something really lightweight. It was what he said in 2017 when he started Vue. And now, now we are going to tell you some stories about the code base for each framework. So starting out with the contribution of to Angular, there are over 1,000 contributors to Angular project, and you can see the commit graph is diverse among many developers, showing the technological stability and continuity. Even though Angular broke away from Angular JS from version two to version nine without any backward compatibility, they have successfully learned the lesson from the past mistakes and from the past framework design and design a new framework and successfully onboard new developers to Angular. And yes, indeed, because today Angular has more than 2000 projects in the Google built by Angular. And React also has more than 1000 contributors and diversified commit among them as well. This is proof that enterprise back back technology do draw more attention 
and stability along the years. Coming to Will, since this was a one-man journey, we all can see that it attracted around 300 contributors, which is a lot for something that one man has built, and he has built it really successfully. But it is, of course, officially lesser than the ones that have an official backup like Facebook or Google, for sure. Did this also translate to real world example where Facebook and Google product adopt their own framework, make it more popular? Why Vue doesn't have a large product base to start off? Vue is a great lightweight and progressive framework. That's why it's so popular today. Even Alibaba uses it. But because of the back, it still is uh, developed more slower and less tested than the other two. So humans are always making a choice, right? And the paradox is not what is right or wrong, but it's of what is best for now. For example, the same choices exist in these three frameworks. All of a good front-end framework would have state management, router, render engines, and pre-render engines. Uh, but the paradox is within itself. For example, React has many router, state management, and form library to choose. This caused contradiction in enterprise when building up their platform or product. Differing from React, Angular, and Vue are opinionated framework, opinionated. When they adopt libraries into the core framework and choose the best ones to maintain and evolve for you, they already have the standard chosen for you, and they already know which one you should use to build your software. To rescue developer in enterprise setting, Angular has created a standard where developers are focused on productivity and not just doing proof of concept, just testing library. By using standard and proven libraries, it makes our life much more easier to decide on our product and to iterate on our product, not to sit around and not to create proof of concept and test out libraries so that we can prove that this would work in a real world or production environment. And yes, Angular is all in one. So you don't almost need to decide much about the library that you have to use. Angular has already chosen everything for you. For example, there are only one Angular standard loud the library. They do come with standard and evolving documentation as well. And remember that in an enterprise environment, enterprise moves slowly. So something that is standard makes their productivity much faster. So to get things done, use framework over library. Now we're going to go to, uh, to show you a couple of statistics and prove similarity for Angular design pattern and object-oriented uh, object oriented programming languages pattern like Java and C Sharp. Uh, Enterprise have rely on strong type language for its stability and security for a long time. Enterprise developers find it easier to adopt Angular because of its similarity in design patterns to the other languages like Java and C Sharp. So as you can see from the Stack Overflow traffic in 2018, OP language, especially C Sharp and Java developers tend to visit Angular. In the opposite the spectrum, Developers are proficient in dynamic type language, adapt to React more easily, since React is original, originally dynamic, dynamic type language. Here is an example of a pattern we use in C Sharp and Angular, the decorator pattern. In C Sharp and Angular, it is used as a class property attributes to define certain behaviors for classes, like routes or components. And TypeScript is a strict, a strict synthetic code and superset of the JavaScript and add optional static typing to the language. It has been proven through the time that TypeScript code is reliable and maintainable. Angular version 2 to 9 was built on TypeScript, not counting AngularJS, of course. And hence, it's a better choice to mitigate human errors and compile time errors 
Microsoft even admitted that without Angular using TypeScript, TypeScript wouldn't have come this far. And now we are going to talk about the challenge of the enterprise software person and present to you the tool that helped solve this madness. Let us start off by showing you the challenges. Enterprise, do they, they do care a lot about consistency in building code, reusing those code, and setting up their workspace to code those code. This also, they also care how those workspace and code are robust, why at the same time maintainable. Between all the above, that's already speed up their productivity greatly. The most important thing that they care about is the confidence of changing the code and not having to risk the change in a production environment causing regression issues. So what have been we going for? It's what we have been explaining. What is an enterprise and how do they see the world or how do they perceive the software development processes in the last 10 minutes or so? So we present you NX, a dev tool to solve all of the above issues. So NX is founded by people who help build Angular, Jeff Cross and Victor Stefan. I'm kind of the fan club of them. And hence their vision is to enable developers to build like Google and Facebook or and Microsoft also in the mono repository. A mono repository, as everyone have been hearing, is a big hit, a big trend that's going on for the past year. It's filled with tools to make their life easier and increase their productivity. This is how. NX has tools to solve complex processes, best practices for huge teams. Since in a small team, anyone would agree that in a small team, we could just fix these issues over lunch, but not in a big team. So NX also help promote code ownership concept through templating, which become very important as the code size and the complexity scale. With three projects, for example, Developer, we always know who is the best person to build a PR, but with 30 projects, they won't. I'm gonna take the same example where three projects, for example, developer really knows what to retest, but in 30 projects environment in an organization, it's not longer a simple process anymore. That's where NX comes in. It provides extensibility for tools to skim, to skim out these unnecessary tests and test the things that they need to test, while it also provides a centralized configuration where a developer can look at the single source of truth together. So any workspace can do all or both? How, Rick? This is because NX has a superhero beneath it. It's called Angular Schematics. Now, I'm not being biased, of course, because Angular Schematic is agnostic to all other languages. It helps us build builders to solve redundant tasks and also build templates. What does a template do, Jane? Pardon? What template does a template do? Yeah, for schematics. So it can. Uh, modify the abstract syntax tree to modify code and generate code in the same way in the consistent and it's also uh you can put the configuration every con configuration in every project in the one single file angular json and a json so i guess everyone has that itch all the time where uh, they have to put their configuration either in an environment.json or in a YML file or the config lies on the cloud or somewhere else in S3 and here and there. NX actually helped them to consolidate those into one space. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So yeah, why all of both already sound excellent? The more you dig, the more go you find. And it also provide a way for the community to contribute useful tool. They build to solve their problem back to the community. And it got all sort of nice and weird use cases, use cases which exist only in enterprise or a bigger corporate software development environment. So like what we have here, we're, we're gonna, show you that uh, we came along a problem where uh, 
we have to build, we have to move a lot of serverless functions into our workspace. And then uh, we have to end up using two or three CLIs to do it, to do the, our CI and then to do our CD. So we take the chance and we take the, the gain from NX extensibility to build our own builders and schematics. It's open source, of course, because we believe that open source always make a better software. And we standardize those and we end up with only one CLI that runs the serverless template, builds it up, and deploys it onto the cloud and allow the developer to test it offline as well. Yeah, I think that's all for today. So if you have a question, feel free to ask us. Thank you so much, Jim and Ricky. So those are very useful insights, which we believe many teams can learn from. So while we are waiting for everyone to drop their questions in the live chat, let's go through some questions we have collected during the registration. So one of the question, they asked, um, how do you improve the slow site loading speed caused by the large number of JavaScript files? Uh, to answer those questions, uh, there are many techniques in different languages and framework. In Angular, however, we use the way of lazy loading components. So you can lazy load the components in your app router, and then it will be loaded. Those JavaScript files will only be loaded when uh, the UI needs it or when the user changes the routes. Okay. And also, also, there is an Angular performance checklist that you can go through that will also help uh, clear out all your performance issues with Angular app. Yeah. Thanks, Vicky. So um, I think the audience is taking some time, shy audience, <laughs> to <laughs> drop their question. I think we have one more uh, that we collected earlier. Jia Sing? Yep. So the question is, do you have any tips on how to debug websites or apps built on Angular? So yeah, let me answer this question. So mostly, I think JavaScript developer they have the uh, standard way to debug. That is a console log in the code. But we we can do it better by using the Chrome Dev to debugger to inspect the variable in the in the memory and do step by step. So thanks to Google to that create Chrome for us to make life easier for developer. Yeah, writing JavaScript, you cannot live without Chrome development tools for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, we actually do have this uh, one very long question from YouTube. Um, I think this is more of you know uh, giving your advice as well as developer aside from the tools. Um, so it's actually two part. Let me flesh out the first part first. So this is a question from Eugene on YouTube. Hi, I recently completed my diploma in CS. I find that our university syllabus still consists of mostly traditional web dev languages. Should I go for a degree as people are migrating towards? People are migrating towards trendier tags such as Angular, Flutter, because I will graduate with skills that are not in trend. <laughs> so uh, Eugene is tuning in from Malaysia, I guess. Um, Eugene is just asking for some advice, like if the school is, you know, teaching things that are not in trend, what, what are your advice for him? Well, James, do you have anything? Uh, should I take? So I, I think let you answer first. I, I will give the answer in my view also. Okay. So, uh, Eugene, I graduated from CS as well, but that's around 15 years ago, I think. And back then, we didn't have any choices of any front-end technology because it was still IE5, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the facts of thing that is uh, in the syllabus, it's not, uh, it's not far-fetched. But in CS diplomas, they try to teach you the basic concept of computer programming. And that concept can be learned from any language. The frameworks and the technology of these days are just something that is uh, sped up and uh, we can develop our product more quickly with more productivity because there's almost all the tools that you can use already. But 
then if only you learn how to use the tools without the basic concepts of computer science, then you would just know how to use the tools only, but not know how to change them. So I guess that's my answer. Thanks, Vicky. Jim, would you like to add on? So I was graduated uh, about two or three years ago. So I, I can answer just from my experience that I got from university. Uh, I think university have or uh, diploma have taught us uh, the basic concept that we can get the fundamental to apply in the real world because the technology the technology is re is really fast right it change all the time university can or diploma cost syllabus cannot uh, catch the technology trend but however they are fundamental that you can get and it will basically apply to all technology just like data structures or algorithm uh, problem solving optimization problem i think you have to take uh, take it seriously about the fundamental and you can learn everything really fast that's a nice point very very good points seems like the q a turned into a mentoring session <laughs> but <laughs> if, yeah <laughs> So uh, if any of you folks do have questions for Ricky and James, whether, you know, uh, CS studying or tech career advice uh, or about their topic, Angular, feel free to drop them on the live chat and also the comment if we do, if they do not manage to answer it during the live stream. So um, I think that's all the time we have for the speakers. So thank you so much, Ricky and James, for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 So once again, thanks to Ba, Leah, James, and Wiki for such an insightful session. And thank you everyone for joining our 12 Lakopi. If you like to rewatch this session, you can always check it out on our Facebook page and or YouTube channel. The speaker presentation slide will be available on our website over the next couple of days. So don't forget to check in. You can also stay connected with us by signing up to our mailing list on our website or follow us on any of the social channels. For your information, our next Lakopi will be taking place on the 28th of July. So next month, it will be all about machine learning. If you or your team are working on a machine learning project that you'd like to share, don't forget to submit your topic to us. Yeah, and we also want to hear your feedback about this event. You can provide us with your email address to stand a chance to win some cool virtual gifts. We'll be selecting five lucky winners, so remember to check your inbox later this week. In two days' time, we will also be launching our In The Cloud series. Two of our Cloud Google developer experts will be joining us to discuss about the best practices of serverless services on Google Cloud Platform and how you can use them to build great applications. So don't forget to RSVP in our Facebook or Meetup page. Until then, stay tuned for our upcoming events on our website and social channels, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Bye.